What is going on, you guys? Pet Platypus here, and it is time to talk about Dragon Ball Super Episode 58. This is a pretty plot-focused episode of Dragon Ball Super. Definitely not as exciting as the last couple episodes, but you need the plot. You need the explanations on Zamasu and fucking Black and everything, so... It's definitely a necessary episode of uh, Dragon Ball Super, but, yeah, not as entertaining. Uh, but, you know, it still works. It still looks good. Uh, I want to start off this review with a couple of things real quick. One's a channel update, but it has to do with Dragon Ball. Uh, the Vegeta discussion video that I'm going to be making will come out on Tuesday because uh, Seven Deadly Sins and Mob Psycho come out tomorrow, so that's already a pretty packed day. But that'll be Tuesday. I want to start this review by giving credit to a specific animator. I'm not sure if he worked on this episode. I think he did, but I'm not sure. I know for sure he worked on episodes 9 and uh, definitely worked on the Gohan Future Trunks episode where they met up and he met Gohan's family. You know, that episode. Uh, the reason why I want to give this animator credit, his name is Yoshitaka ya Yashima. And the reason why I want to give this guy credit is because he solo animated those episodes. Because I know what you were probably thinking before I, uh, you know, if you're familiar with those episodes, you might be thinking, well, why are you giving this guy credit? Those scenes, are, those episodes look okay at best. It's because this guy solo animates. Uh, he does the storyboards, the supervision, and the keyframes by himself. With the exception of one scene by, uh, oh, is his name uh, Futoshi Higashide, I think? He did, like, the Vegeta training sequence in... Uh, the Gohan episode, which looked fantastic, but other than that one scene, uh, Yashima did all the animation for both of those episodes by himself, and several others, too. I think he did uh, some tournament episodes that weren't too essential. He basically does a lot of unessential episodes that don't have a lot of action, and because of that, it frees up so much time for other animators, because he's doing an entire episode by himself, so it really helps Dragon Ball Super's breakneck schedule, and gotta give him massive credit for that uh so yeah definitely wanted to give credit to uh yoshitaka yashima very talented individual even if his animation is kind of rough uh to do it all by himself is insane so massive props to him for helping super look a lot better than it used to and hell just to help it look better when it did look better when it wasn't as consistent so yeah but with that being said to talk about the actual episode itself uh, and once again, I think he worked on this episode as well. I think he soloed this episode, but I'm not positive. And I guess that's a good segue into the technical aspects of this episode. Are in animation serviceable? Um, they were definitely serviceable. Uh, the art and everything looked pretty solid. There were some shots that looked a little iffy, but again, dude's doing it by himself. And all in all, an episode like this doesn't really need the top-tier animation. It is a lot of talking. It is a lot of plot. So with all that being said... That's the animation and art. Pretty much just serviceable, nothing too special. Uh, but still want to give the guy massive props uh, when I say that. Uh, but anyways, in terms of music and everything, it works, it's fine. Uh, as usual, the music's well-timed. I like the soundtrack they were playing when Zabasu showed up at the end. That was really cool. And that's pretty much the music. Uh, as far as pacing goes, average pacing. It's really just a middle-of-the-road episode in every regard from a technical aspect. It's really the story progression that is the big takeaway from this episode as we have Goku, Beerus, Whis, Supreme Kai. They confront uh, Gowasa, I believe his name is, and he's like, nah, nah, Zamasu's good. I talk to him. Everything's fine. Zamasu shows up. Sky turns dark. That tea is obviously bitter as fuck. You don't even have to taste it to know that. I mean, obviously, you're not being, you're not paying attention enough, Gowasu, if you really think he's fine. Uh, so, yeah, we also get him confronting Zuno and learning about the Super Dragon Balls. We get a hypothesis from Whis talking about where Black may have came from and how Zamasu became immortal. He used the Super Dragon Balls to do it. And in order to fast-track the, uh, the Dragon Balls recovery, he went into the future by a year. That's really clever. I think that's really cool. And, uh, again, though, this is just Whis' hypothesis, so we don't know if this is 100% how it happened, but, uh, if it is, that's interesting. Uh, and that's pretty much the big takeaway. Uh, there's some funny moments with Goku, and overall the episode is just sort of, uh, talking about how, you know, can we really beat these guys? They're immortal. You know, we even see a scene in the future with Mai and Yajirobe, and a lot of the people are starting to lose hope because even Goku and Vegeta couldn't beat these guys, and... Yeah, it's really setting in a good tone of hopelessness. Uh, if I had to guess how they're going to beat them, uh, number one, there's the potential for fusion, which that'd be really, really cool. Uh, but I don't know if they will. 
Uh, it would make Gogeta canon. Because, I mean, they could form Vegito, because there is a focus on Patara earrings in this arc, but how do you get them separated, you know? Like, maybe, like... No, because I was going to say, like, they could fuse and then beat the shit out of them in, like, a couple minutes, and then Whis would reverse time and they would separate, but that would also cause Goku Black and Zamasu to come back if he reversed time, so that wouldn't really work. I'm not too sure uh, how fusion would work, but I'd definitely probably have to be Gogeta, even though I prefer Vegito because he's a cocky fucking asshole, but anyways, and his outfit is cooler and yada yada, but yeah, other than that, the only other way I think they could beat these guys is to take out Zamasu before he makes those wishes in the past to alter the future, which shouldn't work based on the rules of Dragon Ball's timelines, but... I also have a theory on why Mai is uh, the way she is in Trunks' future and why Zamasu knows Goku and everything. Two explanations, really. The first explanation is Mai, fuck it. Toriyama said fuck it. And for Zamasu, uh, maybe Toriyama said fuck it, but I also want to say maybe Zamasu is the... He's not the future Zamasu from Trunks' timeline. He's the future, he's the future Zamasu from the present timeline that went to that future because there's no fucking Z-Fighters. I mean, think about it. He wants to wipe out all mortals. Goku Black is strong, but Zamasu would know from facing Goku, okay, my black dude is not strong enough to beat this guy. Let's go to a future timeline where he can kill everyone because there's no Z-Fighters. And uh, so I think this is probably a Zamasu from the future of, like, a couple months from the present timeline. Same timeline as Goku and Vegeta and Majin Buu was awakened and Beerus and all that stuff. Present timeline, canon timeline, all that shit. Same Zamasu, but from a few months in advance where he already has his immortality, he made Goku black, and he went to a timeline, he went to a future where there's no Z fighters to stand in his way. The other explanation as to how he knows Goku is when, when Goku black went back in time... He used the time ring, and it opened up a rift, and through that rift was Future Trunks' timeline. Because of that wormhole, those two timelines were connected for a second, and that could have sort of, like, created a time paradox that merged the two, which would explain why Mai is as old as she is, it would explain why Zamasu knows who Goku Black is, or he knows who uh, Goku is and everything, and it's because the two timelines became merged in that moment, and it's also what prompted Goku to go meet Zamasu, which is why Zamasu would know who he is and what would set everything in motion, and while it normally wouldn't affect Trunks' timeline because it's a separate timeline, because that rift connected them for a second, that wormhole connected them for a second, it could have created a paradox that combined the two timelines, and that's why Trunks says, yeah, I defeated Majin Buu and blah blah blah, but all these other things still don't add up. Will this be explained in the series? No idea. Did the theory I just give you guys make 100% sense? I have no idea. You could probably poke a million holes in that because you can poke a million holes in time travel. So I'm going to take it for what it is and see what happens going forward. But uh, that's just my theory on that. And that's pretty much the episode. It's good. Uh, I would say there's really good story progression on finding out where Goku Black came from, but it is just Whis's hypothesis. It's not solid story progression. So with all this being said, I can really only give this episode like a 7, 7.5 out of 10. It's just a good episode of Dragon Ball Super. It doesn't really stand out too much. Just sort of average, middle-of-the-road episode. But it did focus on the plot. It did focus on the characters trying to figure out the mystery, which I think is cool. Because we don't get a lot of mystery storylines like this in uh, Dragon Ball, usually. So, uh, with all that being said, what did you guys think of this episode of Dragon Ball Super? You can tell me in the comments section below. You can also follow me on Instagram or add me on PSN. I'm Pat Platypus on both. You can also give this video a thumbs up and share it on social media. Both of those would help me out a lot. Subscribe if you haven't already or if you like what you've seen here. And I want to talk to you guys later. Thanks for watching. Bye.